This is Rome, the centre of the Roman Catholic world. Here, in around 1630, Pope Urban VIII heard Gregorio Allegri's Miserere for the first time. And he found the piece so beautiful, he decreed that it should never be sung outside the walls of the Sistine Chapel. Yet today, the Miserere has become one of the most popular and recorded pieces of sacred music ever written. The story of how this piece escaped the confines of the Vatican and evolved over the next 300 years is as captivating as the music itself. It's a tale that involves Mozart, an obscure English music scholar, a choir master from Worcester, and a recording made here in Cambridge in the 1960s. They all helped to transform Allegri's 17th century original into the iconic work we know today. Gregorio Allegri was born here, in Rome, in around 1582. From an early age, the Catholic Church and its music had a huge influence on him. Although we know little about Allegri's early life, we do know from church records that in 1591, when he was about nine, he joined the choir of San Luigi dei Francesi in Rome. It was a time when the Catholic Church was still at the height of its power. And as head of state, the Pope wielded huge influence, not just on religious matters, but over virtually every aspect of life. And this was particularly true of music, as at the time, the Catholic Church was by far the biggest single patron of the arts. Allegri grew up in a world dominated by the godfather of Italian music, Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina, who almost half a century before redefined sacred music with his extraordinary masterpiece, the Missa Papai Marcelli. This piece would have a huge influence on Allegri's own music. Harry Christophers and his choir, The Sixteen, have become world famous for their interpretation of polyphony, which means many sounds, the style of music perfected by Palestrina. Palestrina had really developed the polyphony as, as we know it, and uh, it was his music that really the popes uh, revered. Allegri was brought into the, you know, the sacred world of the papal chapels and everything he did in the musical world would have been under that influence. The young Allegri would have learned the intricacies of polyphony well. After his time as a choir boy, he became the pupil of Giovanni Maria Nannini, an intimate friend of Palestrina's. He must have shown considerable talent because at the age of 25, he took up a post as singer and composer at the Cathedral in Fermo, on the outskirts of the Papal States. Then in 1628, he returned to Rome, and following in Palestrina's footsteps, he joined the choir of the Sistine Chapel. And it was at some point in the next decade that Allegri composed his masterpiece, the Miserere. It was written for the Tenebrae service, which means shadows or darkness, symbolizing the extinguishing of the light of Christ. Performed only in Holy Week at the end of a service dominated by simple plain chant, this haunting setting of Psalm 51 would have sounded particularly poignant in its spirit of humility and repentance. Harry Christophers has been able to put together what he believes to be Allegri's original composition, 
and it's much simpler than the version we know today. Well, this is from two manuscripts um, in the Vatican, dating from around Allegri's time, uh, and so piecing them together, we, this is, we're pretty certain that this is probably what Allegri wrote. It's very simple, isn't it? It's a, and it's, but it's incredibly beautiful, and in the place, its place in the Tenebrae service, it would be incredibly prayerful. Allegri wrote his piece for two contrasting groups, a main choir and a solo quartet. Along with simple plain chant, they take it in turns to sing each of the 19 verses, and both choirs finally join together at the end. But the version we know today is much more elaborate than the music Allegri actually wrote. Allegri's original was very much basic, it was bare bones. It followed on again from the fact that in the Tenebrae service uh, it had become custom that at the end of the service you'd hear a piece of music. You know, up to that point in the service you'd had one bit of music, the uh, Lamentations. The rest of the service was plain song or, or, or said. So this final piece of music was very, very special. Even in its original form, which we rarely hear today, Allegri's Miserere still had a big impact on the pontiff when he first heard it in the middle of the 17th century. Pope Urban was delighted with the piece. He decreed that it should be sung only during Holy Week and that it should never be heard outside the walls of the Sistine Chapel. Anyone who defied this decree faced excommunication from the Catholic Church. So, for almost a century and a half, Allegri's Miserere could only be heard here, in the Sistine Chapel, by a select few. The manuscript was never published, and the piece could only be performed as a highlight of Holy Week. Thanks largely to Pope Urban's decree, Allegri's Miserere soon achieved legendary status. And the Tenebrae services featuring the piece became a must-see event for the wealthy on their grand tours of Europe. But in 1770, a precocious teenager dared to defy Pope Urban's edict. According to legend, this 14-year-old, having heard the piece only twice, went home and wrote it down from memory, thus creating possibly one of the first bootleg editions in musical history. It's astonishing to think that a teenager could remember with such apparent ease this long 12-minute piece. But then, this was no ordinary teenager. This was Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. At the time, Mozart was already famous, a child prodigy. He was on a European tour with his father. He'd been mesmerizing the nobility across the continent with his astonishing talents. While in Rome, news of his illicit transcriptions spread across the city like wildfire, and Mozart was summoned back to the Vatican by the Pope himself. The young Mozart must have known that he faced being banished from the church. However, he was in for a surprise. Instead of excommunicating him, Pope Clemens XIV, much to everyone's surprise, congratulated the 14-year-old on his musical abilities. Now, after 150 years and with tacit papal approval, Allegri's Miserere could escape the confines of the Sistine Chapel. Copies of Mozart's transcription were about to spread rapidly across Europe. 
few months after he'd broken the papal edict and transcribed the piece, Dr. Charles Burney, a British music enthusiast from Shrewsbury, went to see the young Mozart. Nobody is quite sure, but it'd be nice to think that Burney got a copy of the Miserere from Mozart himself. Whatever happened, he brought a copy back to England and in 1771 he published it. It was an instant hit, not only in Georgian England, but all the way across Europe. Over the next 200 years, there were hundreds of variations of the Miserere, each one moving further away from Allegri's original. Meanwhile, Mozart continued on his European tour and shortly after his copy of the Miserere arrived in England, he came here himself, staying for a while here in Soho, in the heart of London's West End. By the time Mozart reached London, his European tour had proved to be a huge financial success. Perhaps breaking a papal edict even enhanced his reputation. During Allegri's time, and indeed when Mozart had heard the piece, the highest parts were sung by a very particular kind of singer. They were singers who had undergone a peculiarly barbaric surgical procedure in order to preserve their unbroken voices. They were the castrati, men who had been castrated for the sake of their voice. For just over 300 years, the castrati were the star singers in the Cappella Sistina. We have to remember, I think, that really in the sort of middle of the 1500s, they relied on the quality of the, of the castrato singers at the time. We remember that the choir consisted, top three voices were all castratos. Harry Christophers believes that the castrati embellished Allegri's original composition with their own flourishes and high notes. And that's the real reason why the work became so highly prized by the Vatican. Probably why there's this feeling that if Allegri's work was ever released out of the Sistine Chapel, somebody would face excommunication, etc. I think that was to do much, much more with the embellishments. Uh, they, they were the trade secret. It was those embellishments that weren't allowed to get out. One of the earliest accounts of a castrati singing the piece with the soaring high notes we know today came in the early 19th century from another famous musical figure, a German, Felix Mendelssohn. Quite apart from being a great composer, Felix Mendelssohn was also something of a musical historian. He championed the music of many great composers, and after a trip to the Vatican, it seems he was also one of the first to note down Allegri's Miserere with the famous high notes. Harry Christophers has been working with his singers on this higher version that Mendelssohn heard. really enjoy singing the piece. For me, it sits quite comfortably in my voice and I like, quite like singing high. The hardest thing, actually, is singing in the quartet because the hardest thing is getting the harmonies right and keeping the tuning between the four of you. So although it seems as though the top C is the impressive, amazing thing that comes out from nowhere, uh, you've got to think that the quartet are normally pulling together as a team and trying to make sure that the whole thing works. This is King's College, Cambridge, home to one of the most famous choirs in the world. In the 1960s, they performed the new version of Allegri's Miserere, this time in English. It was written by Sir Ivor Atkins, choir master of Worcester Cathedral, who had brought together many different interpretations of Allegri's Miserere, including extracts from Bernie's and Mendelssohn's transcriptions. In 1963, Sir Ivor's successor at Worcester, who then became choir master of King's College, Cambridge, decided to record Sir Ivor's version. It would prove to be a phenomenal success. That choir master was Sir David Wilcox. Now, the big question, of course, that most people want to know is about the famous treble solo, which goes up yes. very, very 
high C. Ah, this is Roy Goodman, who was a very, very good chorister. He came from Howell in Yorkshire. I should think he was 12 and a half, maybe 13. Of course, he's so very at the end of his career's troubles. Yes, so experience. we were already waiting to go, and nobody, Roy Goodman hadn't arrived. And I thought, oh dear, I'm sure I said four, you know. But he arrived breathless. About five minutes later, he said, I'm terribly sorry, but we had a rugger match today, and I was captain. I couldn't leave. And it was so good, I couldn't believe it, because it is a difficult piece. After its release in 1963, the record proved to be a phenomenal success, becoming a classic in its own right. For three and a half centuries, Allegri's Miserere has changed and evolved as each new generation has interpreted it for itself. There's no way of knowing if that was Allegri's intention, but in any case, the piece has become one of the most popular and enduring pieces of sacred music ever written. And now to perform the piece in its entirety in Latin with those famous high notes is Harry Christopher's and his choir, The Sixteen. <laughs>
classical music and so much more can be heard with Jess Gillam, the incredibly talented Cumbrian saxophonist. Listen to her podcast, This Classical Life, now on Sounds. <laughs>